Uh, I can fall out the window. Okay, they're giving us a thumbs up. It means we're on. Thank you for visiting with us tonight. And if you're online watching us, thank you for that too. We have some announcements to give before we get started with our devotion and our, our lesson. So I'll try to get through these and hopefully I pronounce everybody's names right. Okay, Jackie Weiscarver's husband, Dave, he will have surgery on his heart valve next week. It's not a major surgery like an open heart surgery. It's going through the arteries and going that route. So that's a good thing. Neil Schmidtberger, he's here tonight, but he received a good report on his blood work, so you can talk to him and thank you for your prayers for him in that regard. He comes in almost every morning and sings and, and talks to us about it, and we get up-to-date news on everything going on with Neil. So that's good. So he's a happy camper when he's walking these halls. All right. Uh, Nathan Warner, longtime friend of the Nolans, and Don and Nancy Johnson, aunt of Ruthie Sarwiski, uh, lost their home in the fire last weekend. If you wish to give a card, a gift card to these, either of these families, please give it to the office and we will pass it on. A uh, reminder, daylight savings times begin this weekend. Set your clocks ahead one hour before you go to bed Saturday night. That's easy to forget, isn't it? So let's remember that. A come and go baby shower for Crystal and Jason Hackler is this Sunday, March 13th from 2 to 3.15 in the Fellowship Hall. To donate toward a gift, see Crystal DeWint or Melody Runyon. All ladies are invited to attend a short meeting for the SMC Ladies Retreat, which is scheduled for September the 23rd and 24th. We will meet in the Fellowship Hall one week from Sunday, immediately following morning worship. Uh, contact Hillary Carden, uh, Lily Porter, or Michelle Schmucker with any questions. Due to the scheduling conflict, I hope you got this column all last night, Due to the scheduling conflict, the Zane Perkins conference that was to be held this weekend has been postponed. Plans are to offer it sometime this fall. We just didn't feel like we had enough attendance. We want a better attendance, so to make it a good deal for him when he comes. And this was partially his idea, too, so it wasn't on us. Nominations are now being accepted for the elders and deacons. There are yellow forms uh, at all entrances to the auditorium. Please fill it out and return to one of the elders. <clears throat> Cynthia Moravic Mar just gave us this news tonight. She's going to be leaving Friday for Peru. Please keep her in your prayers if you would. Huh? And the boys are going with, we don't get them in class Sunday morning? What kind of a deal is that? Okay. And then uh, Alan put on here, Dear Eastwood Prayer Warriors, Sister Carol Salee asked that we would be in prayer for her sister, Shirley, who lives in Arizona. They think her sister has had another heart attack, and her blood sugar numbers are extremely high. To complicate things even more, Shirley is refusing to go to the hospital. So that's not good. And then Gary, Jean's friend uh, down here, <clears throat> I mean Karen's friend, I'm sorry. Jean is the one I need to pray for, sorry. <laughs> and uh, friend Jean Van Vohees, did I say that right? Okay, she's, she's having a lot of heart problems and needs... Uh, prayers on our behalf to help her with those problems that are that are giving her some fits. So let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, we have many on our prayer list tonight, and we, we just ask you to comfort those that you can. Please heal those that you can. Help us to uh, be brothers and sisters in Christ to those that we love and in, enjoy being with. Let them Help us to let them know that uh, they are loved by us by whatever way and whatever means we can do that. Father, we ask you to be with the uh, uh, situation overseas, and we just pray for the leaders, wherever they might be, in, in every situation, every country. We pray that they can look for you, for their wisdom and, and their guidance, and we know that some of them are not going to do that, but we pray that that can happen for those of us that believe in you. And, Father, we just ask you for your uh, assistance over there. We know that maybe uh, or probably you have some kind of a providence working over there, whatever that might be. We pray that things can happen that, that can be in a better situation than it is now. Father, we thank you for the church. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that we have the blessings that we have here in the United States. We're thankful for that. We're thankful for this assembly. We're thankful for uh, the nice warm building we have here even to meet in. We pray that as the weather comes in tonight and tomorrow that people will be safe and it won't be as bad and nasty as it was on Sunday. We just pray for those kind of things to happen. We just thank you for everything you do for us and help us to always thank you and pray to you and talk to you about these things and never neglect to do so. 
In Jesus' name, amen. There's a few things that we say once in a while. They're called idioms. And I have a book about, I don't know, that thick at home. My sister got me one time because if you're around a family get-together or uh, anything, even a, a guy's coffee, whatever, men's class, whoever, people say things that are idioms. You know, where do they come from? How did they originate? You just never know. Well, we might say things like, let's get down to brass tacks. Well, we say things like that all the time. In my idiom book, I looked it up, and it said, in the 1800s, when, when the shop would sell material, and you wanted to buy a, a yard of material or whatever, they had a ruler, long board up there with ser several brass tacks on there. And instead of taking out a measuring stick and doing that every time, they would just pull the material over to one or two brass tacks, whatever the measurement was, and they would sell you that amount of material by the yard. That's what it said. Now, I don't, I'm just going off what the book said. I wasn't there. Okay. <laughs> so, and a lot of times we say, well, he's a southpaw. You know, we all know that that means a left-handed person. Well, according to what my little book said, it said in a professional baseball game, a pitcher was on the mound, a left-handed pitcher was on the mound, and he was facing the south, and the sun was in his eyes, and he got the nickname of southpaw. Now, that's where he says it comes from. I don't know. I wasn't there either. Okay. But there are some silly things that are said that may not be an idiom necessarily, but you know what it means. Like, for example... I was watching the other night a Tom Selleck movie, Quigley Down Under, and because I'm a carpenter, I love this little saying. She said, he said, lady, you're about a half a bubble off a of plum, and that's for certain. <laughs> <laughs> so, you see, I like those kind of little thoughts like that. So where am I going with this? A lot of the idioms that we say today are biblical, and they come from the Bible. I'm going to give you a test. I've got a few here in my hand. And then, see if you know where they come from. Then I'm going to give you the scripture and read the scripture, how it's listed. I know you're going to know the first one. I made it easy for you. You're a thorn in my side, or you're a thorn in your side. Where's that come from? That comes from Paul. That's right. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. So keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revel uh, revelations. A thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. That's right. That's right. Have you ever heard of somebody say that it's the signs of the times? You ever heard of that? That's all these I'm reading now are all biblical. You know where that comes from? It comes from Matthew 16, 3. And in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearances of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Jesus said it. Nothing but skin and bones. You ever heard that one? Maybe you've heard it recently because Mr. Job was in this class not too long ago, and that's where it comes from. Job 19, 19 and 20. All my friends intimidate, uh, all my, I mean, all my intimate friends, there you go, it, desert me, though I have turned against, and they, they have turned against me, I am nothing but skin and bones. Isn't that something? No rest for the wicked. My mom used to say it all the time. She had six kids. <laughs> but she used to always say that. I'm sure you've heard that and you say it yourself. Uh, she said it about me, that's for sure. You know me too well, Hank. Isaiah 57, 20 through 21. But the wicked are like the tossing sea which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. I know you probably know this one, the blind leading the blind. Yeah, we not only have seen it, we, we witnessed it, but we probably said it, right? And you know that comes from Jesus, Matthew 15, 13, and 14. Let them move alone. They may be blind leaders of the blind, and if they blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. I'm at, I'm at my wit's end. I didn't know that was in the Bible, but it looks like it is. Psalms 107, 27. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are, and are at their wit's end. Huh, I didn't know about that one. I know you probably know this one. The writing is on the wall. Mr. Right? 
Daniel 5. In this passage, handwriting appears on the wall during the king's feast, and Daniel's interpretation of the writing predicts the king's demise. Isn't that something? You probably know this one too. Go the extra mile. You all know what it means. Go the extra mile. Matthew 5.41, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Well, that's hard to do sometimes. It depends on who you're dealing with, isn't it? Live by the sword, die by the sword. All right. Matthew 26, 52, then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. All right. Let's see here. Have you ever talked about to, talk to anybody and you're, you're trying to get them to agree with you? And you, let, you might say something like, let's see this thing eye to eye, right? Okay, that's the next one. Isaiah 52, 8. The watchman's shaft shall lift up his voice. With the voice together they shall sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring them again to Zion. Huh. Oh, and maybe you've, you've said this before. Let's get to the root of the matter. Job 19, 28. But ye should say, why persecute we him, seeing the root of the matter is found in me? <laughs> we thought some people made these up sometimes, right? These are biblical stuff. A drop in the bucket. We all know what that is. Isaiah 40, 15. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, it takes up the aisles as fine dust. A drop in the bucket. Well, I just thought I'd throw a few of those at you to be a little bit different tonight. You know me, I like to be different once in a while. And so... Some of these things that we say have a lot of meaning. It's kind of like what Stafford North was saying that time. Remember, he says, he's saying this, but it really means this, you know. That's what all these idioms really are, and, and that's what we do when we say them. Some of them are funny, some of them are real. Anyway, Mr. Neal is going to lead us down a couple of songs he's picked out. Let's follow him. Steve, your mother had six kids. My mother had nine. What we heard a lot was... Sit down and be quiet. That's, that's pretty tough. Uh, we're going to sing uh, 716. Sing to me of heaven. Sing to me of heaven. Sing that song of peace. From the toils that bind me, let fill release. Burdens will be lifted that are pressing so. Showers of great blessing for my heart will flow. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven's sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven as I walk alone, dreaming of the comrades that so long have gone. In a fairer region, morning angels run. They are happy as they sing that old sweet song. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream its golden glory of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven's sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven tenderly and low, till the shadows o'er me rise and swiftly go. When my heart is weary, when the day is long, sing to me of heaven, sing that old sweet song. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden 
glory of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven's sweetest song of all. What happened to me on uh, Monday, I had blood work to do, and um, my white blood count was way down, and they called me, and I had to have another test done today, and uh, the Lord came through for me. 5.8. It was down to 3, and it came up almost twice as much, so thank you for all the prayers. Now we'll be singing the 792, My Eyes Are Dry. We'll sing this through twice, and then after the last one, we'll go back up to what can be done and sing the chorus one more time. Okay. And the second time I sing it, I'm going to go up uh, half a step for you guys. My eyes are dry, my faith is old, my heart is hard, my prayers are cold, and I know how I ought to be alive to you and dead to me. What can be done to an old heart like mine? Soften it up with oil and wine. The oil is you, your spirit of love. Please wash me anew in the wine of your blood. My eyes are dry, my faith is old, my heart is hard, my prayers are cold, and I know how I ought to be alive to you and dead to me. What can be done to an old heart like mine? Soften it up with oil and wine. The oil is you, your spirit of love. Please wash me anew in the wine of your blood. What can be done to an old heart like mine, soften it up with oil and wine. The oil is you, your spirit of love. Please wash me anew in the wine of your blood. All right, well, good evening, everyone. It wasn't quite cold enough to try to get a sticker. Remember the last time it was like sub 30 degrees, and I said, man, you almost need a cold weather sticker to be able to make it to our Wednesday night. But it is a little cool out there, but, but not too bad. Let's go ahead and get our Bibles out tonight. We are going to be in chapter 15 of Job. Job chapter 15. Now, before we start reading along in 15, I want to begin with a question. What's one of the nicest things that someone has done or could do when you're facing adversity? 
Now, I uh, gave the opposite of that, that question several weeks ago. What's like some of the worst things that you can say when somebody's going through a hard time? And man, did we get the, the audience participation. But what's uh, some of the better things that we can do when a person's going through adversity? Or maybe you want to share for a minute. Maybe something that was done nice to you when you were going through a difficult time. How about that? Man, do we have a lot to learn then? All right, Alan, yeah. Last year, I, I went through a yes. time with my right arm. True. Had a arm I couldn't even move with. Yes. Uh, someone knew I was going around and they gave us a gift card to tell us how much they appreciate it. Wow, wow. So Alan was talking about uh, when his arm, you know, was just nearly paralyzed there, couldn't hardly move it at all, and obviously feeling down and concerned about that. Somebody gave him a gift card, just said, Hey, we were just thinking about you. And just, just kind of a mysteriously, you know, that's right. That's the best kind, you know. Don't let the left hand know what the right hand's doing there. Okay, what else? When somebody's going through a difficult time, what, what's, what's something positive? And maybe some of you guys watching online, maybe type, type in the chat box up there, and I'll go back and read that later. What's, what's something that you could do to really help somebody when they're going through an adverse situation? Maybe pray with them, Linda said. Yes, what else did I hear? Just be there, just to be present, just to be a listening ear. All right. I noticed I was listening to a podcast early this morning as I was getting ready, and Jay Glazer, he's kind of a well-known football and analyst, MMA guy, big muscly guy, and he's a good friend of uh, Michael Strahan that played for the Giants, and he's on one of the news stations and stuff like that. And he noticed his friend was being interviewed, and then called him up afterwards. He said, you doing okay? Is his friend, this Jay Glazer, former MAA, MMA wrestler, big muscly guy, he struggles with anxiety and depression. He said, I've been like that since I've been a little kid. He said, I had ADD, still has ADD all of his life. And his friend noticed something wasn't quite right with him. He said, you want me to come over? He said, no, I, I think I'll be all right. But isn't that good to have friends that notice when you're down and you're struggling, and they see that look in your eye, your body language, maybe your head's down a little bit, and they just want to be present to help you out. All right? What else can we do? Yes, Karen. Yeah, just a simple call. Send a card. Barb, did I see one? Yes. Wow. All right, Bob sharing that, you know, Barb was sharing that when she was at home, didn't, couldn't drive her car around. Cousin brings her a, a bowl of soup there. Did I see another one over here? Yes. Uh-huh. Just need a hug. Just a spontaneous hug just breaks out. And that's exactly what you're needing at that time. You bet. Did I see another hand over here? Oh, uh, Cynthia in the back. Oh, all right. Yeah, Dar. Just kind of show up over there, uh-huh, just to let you know, hey, I was thinking about you here. All right, yes, Cynthia did get one going. Yes. 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 Just say, hey, I can just go through the grieving and not have to worry about some of the financial things that when her father passed away. Yes, Steve has one. Yes, sir. Yes. All right. So Steve is sharing, you know, when he had his knee surgery, you know, Lloyd was there to help give him some rides. And then, you know, when the weather got bad, snow popped out. Here's, you know, Lloyd just with the snowblower moving stuff around. I remember years ago when we were over on uh, Apple Lane, we had a heavy, heavy rain. And our, uh, our, our little, uh, what do they call those little drainage things that go under your, what? What? Culvert. culvert, yeah. Culverts were all plugged up. Guess what happens when you get large amounts of rain and your culverts are plugged up? <laughs> it's like a bathtub. And so the water's filling up. And me and Chris were getting nervous. The kids were little. We're, oh, boy, what are we going to do? And uh, I opened up the back door. Boy, that was the wrong deal. All of a sudden, I got an indoor pool, you know, down in there. That thing filled up about four foot of water. And so we started calling some church members are coming over. And we're starting to try to dig to open up the trench. That, that's not doing anything. And then uh, Dan Osner came with his bobcat. 
and got that thing in there and moved a bunch of dirt and dumped that water out of there. So we were so appreciative going through a difficult time and friends showed up to help us in a time of need. As we look at Job um, here tonight, chapter 15, 16, and 17, we're going to see a little bit of a repeated behavior. You'll notice this as you go through this book. The friends are accusing Job of doing some wrongdoing, and Job is having to defend himself to say, no, I didn't do anything wrong. You know, God has just got it out for me for whatever reason. So we're going to see a, a friend that started it off. It was Eliphaz. Most scholars believe he was the oldest one. The first time that he goes around, he's fairly polite, and he's complimentary, and then kind of you know, says, well, here's some of the things you've done wrong, but if you'll do this and this, God will make everything right. Now that it's been going on for a little while, he's going to be a little more blunt with Job. So let's see what his friend, quote unquote, Eliphaz, has to say to him when Job is so down and out in life. And we'll see what Job's response is to that. First of all, verse 1. Let's do verse 1 to 6. Then Eliphaz the Temanite replied, Would a wise man answer with empty notions? Or fill his belly with hot east wind. Now before our services got started, uh, only people were on the south side of the congregation. I was like, well, what's the deal there? And they said, well, there's more hot air coming out of there. And I said, well, um, tonight we're going to be talking about some hot air here. And so chapter 15, uh, verse 2, Eliphaz is saying to Job, hey, a wise man wouldn't answer with empty words. Or fill his belly with a hot east wind. Guess what, Job? You, you're, you're nothing but a hot windbag. You know, things that you're saying and arguing against us with, it's nothing but a bunch of hot air. Verse 3. Would he, speaking of a, a true wise person, would he argue with useless words, with speeches that have no value? But you even undermine piety and hinder devotion to God. So God are the niceties, Gone is the compassion and the encouragement from Eliphaz. He's telling him, you undermine godliness. You are a sinner. Your worship, your relationship to God is being ruined because of your evil ways. Verse 5. Your sin prompts your mouth. You adopt the tongue of the crafty. Your own mouth condemns you, not mine. Your own lips testify against you. And so he said, here's my proof that you are as bad as I'm telling you that you are. Your words give you away. Your heart is wrong, and it's coming out in your speech, in your words. The things that you're trying to defend yourself with, we know that they're false. We know that they're lies. I mean, your tongue is giving you away that you're a bad person, that you're an evil person. Then he starts with the questions here. Let's look at uh, verses uh, 7 through 12. Look at all the questions that he asks. Are you, speaking to Job, are you the first man ever born? Were you brought forth before the hills? Steve was talking about idioms. You ever heard the phrase, are you, uh, he's as old as the hills? Where do you think that might have came from? Right here in Job, all right? Were you brought forth before the hills? Verse 8, do you listen in on God's counsel? When God is meeting up in the heavenly places, talking with his angels, you part of that counsel there, Job? Is that how smart and wise you are? Do you limit wisdom to yourself? What do you know that we do not know? What insights do you have that we do not have? The gray-haired and the aged are on our side, Men even older than your father. Now, jump down to verse uh, 17 and 18, then we'll back up again. Listen to me. I'll explain to you. Let me tell you what I've seen. What wise men have declared, hiding nothing, received from their fathers. And so what is he trying to say there? Where has he got his information from? Eliphaz, more than likely, who is the oldest of, of Job's three friends. What is he relying on? His word coming from, notice this, the gray hair and the aged, men older than your father. 
So Job will live another 120 years. He's got to be 50, 60, 70 years old at this time in his life. So he's going to live a long life. And he said, man, this is older than your father, this information that's been around. This has been around for ages, this law of retribution. You do bad things. God in heaven is aware of it, and he's going to punish you for those bad things. You do good things, God's going to recognize. He's going to bless you with that. He said, our fathers, their fathers, their great-grandfathers, this has been around for a long time. Where are you getting your wisdom from? Now, is there an element of truth in what Eliphaz is saying? Yeah, it would make sense, wouldn't it? That God does judge sin in the world, and uh, we do reap what we sow, but it wasn't true in the life of Job. And Job, as we've seen in some of our previous classes, gives them examples to say, well, there's these guys that are robbers and thieves, and they're prospering, and they're doing well. Here's some other marauders. They're, they're doing terrible things and, and all, but God's not punishing them. So he's questioning that long-time theology that's been around. So that ought to make us really check out just because something that we've been taught's been around for a long time, we need to verify this is truly a word from God, and it's not just a man-made philosophy, or maybe there's a partial truth to it. We need to make sure that this is really rock-solid teaching from God, that this is a word from the Lord. Because just because you're older doesn't mean that we're always right, that we're always wise. Remember I talked about last week? There's such a thing as adult adolescence. That just because you're old does not guarantee that you're wise. Now, naturally, hopefully, with our experiences in life, we're adding to that wisdom. But his argument isn't foolproof. Well, we got this from the aged ones. We got this from the gray hair. Everybody knows this. We've been teaching this for hundreds and thousands of years. That was his argument. All right, continue on with his questions. Verse 11. Are God's consolations... Not enough for you, words spoken gently to you. He's probably referring to himself and his other friends. They think they have a word from God and that they're speaking gently to him. And it doesn't seem too gentle with how blunt and how painful some of the things that they said. That the reason your kids died is because of your sin. In fact, your sin, the punishments that you're receiving isn't uh, as great as it should be. God should be punishing more. His friends have said that to him. We've been able to read those kinds of things. So now he asks a few more questions. Why has your heart carried you away? Why do your eyes flash so that you vent your rage against God and pour out such words from your mouth? And if you were listening to Job as he's debating and arguing with his friends, you could probably hear the tone of his voice. His impassioned plea, what have I done wrong? Let me talk to God. I know I haven't sinned to this great degree. And they're like, we can see you're angry. We see that burning fire in your eyes and the things that you're saying about God. I mean, your words are giving you away. Verse 14, what is man that he would be pure? Or one born of woman that he could be righteous? If God places no trust in his holy ones, that would be the angels, if even the heavens are not pure in his eyes, how much less man who is vile and corrupt, who drinks up evil like water. All right. If even the angels are capable of sin, and we know that they are, he said, what about humanity? Now, how many people have sinned? How many would you say? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, not even one. We all stumble in many ways. So he's pointing out, hey, humanity's proclivity to sin. It could be capable of the angels up in heaven. We know mankind, uh, human beings are sinners. Yet you're trying to be so righteous and pure that your words are giving you away. We know that you've done something bad. Verse 17, listen to me. I'll explain to you. Let me tell you what I've seen. Again, it's what he's seen. What the wise men have declared, hiding nothing received from their fathers, to whom alone the land was given when no alien passed among them. And now he goes on to describe, here's what's going to happen to the wicked. 
All of his days, the wicked man suffers torment. The ruthless through all the years stored up for him. Terrifying sounds fill his ears. When all seems well, marauders attack him. He despairs the escaping darkness. He's marked for the sword. He wanders about, uh, he wanders about food for vultures. He knows the day of darkness is at hand. Distress and anguish fill him with terror. They overwhelm him like a king poised to attack. And so again, this is this law of retribution. That when you are a sinner and you're a wicked person, these are the bad things that are going on in your life. I mean, you're nervous, you're paranoid, you're upset. Bad things are happening to you. Why? Verse 25. Because he shakes his fist at God. He bumps himself against the Almighty, defiantly charging against him with a thick, strong shield. Though his face is covered with fat and his waist bulges with flesh. Now Eliphaz has to get personal, doesn't he? He says his face is full of fat, so put on some weight. His belly's full of fat. You know what he's saying there? The rich, prosperous person that's wicked. I'm like, just because we've got a little plump on from wintertime doesn't mean that you're bad, right? Amen. <laughs> I was thinking, of, you know, what's that old show, Dukes of Hazzard? Remember old Boss Hog? You know, that's who I thought about, you know, uh, thinking about something like this. He's like, you know, these fat, rich people over here, what's going to happen to them? I was like, boy, you don't have to get so rude here, verse 27. He, this is what's going to happen to him, verse 28. He'll inhabit ruined towns. And houses where no one lives, houses crumble to the rubble. He'll no longer be rich, and his wealth will not endure. Nor will his possessions spread over the land. He will not escape the darkness of flame, will wither his shoots, and the breath of God's mouth will carry him away. Let him not deceive himself by trusting what is worthless, for he will get nothing in return. Before his time, he'll be paid in full, and his branches will not flourish. He will be like a vine stripped of its unripe grapes, like an olive tree shedding its blossoms, for the company of the godless will be barren. Fire will consume the tents of those who love bribes. They conceive trouble and give birth to evil. Their womb fashions deceit. Boy, look at that beautiful poetry in describing this. But in a thumbnail sketch, what was Eliphaz saying? What is going to be the final outcome of the evil or the wicked person? What's going to happen to him? He uses all kind of images and vivid, colorful images. What's going to happen? Yeah, they'll be ruined. They'll be destroyed. You know, whether it's like a, like a flower that falls off or a house that gets burned down, he's just going to be ruined. Okay, that's that theory of retribution again. The wicked will reap what he sows. Okay, God will make sure of that. All right, now, Job is going to have an opportunity to answer his friend's accusations, making fun of me with my chubby cheeks and my round uh, belly here, you know, and the bad things are going to happen. So let's see how Job re replies to Eliphaz. Verse 1, chapter 16. I've heard many things like these. Miserable comforters are you all. How does he, how does he reply to his friends, Bildad, Eliphaz, and so far? We, they're counselors, but what kind are they? <laughs> yeah, keep, keep, your, keep your money there. Uh, literally, comforters of trouble. Yeah, you guys are counselors and comforters, but man, you just give me trouble. You, you haven't helped me at all. Verse number three. Will your long-winded speeches never end? What ails you that you keep on arguing? He's like, man, you talk, call me a, a, a hot windbag. How about your speeches that you guys keep lecturing me about? Well, they know, are you sick or something? What's wrong with you? Verse 4, I also could speak like you. If you were in my place, I would make fine speeches against you. Shake my head at you, but my mouth would encourage you. And comfort from my lips would bring you relief. He said, you know, if I was in your shoes... It'd be so easy for me to point the finger at you. It would be so easy for me to wag my head, man, alive. You guys have really done some bad things. But he said, here's what I would do. I wouldn't be a miserable comforter like you guys have been for me. I would encourage you. I would comfort you from my lips and bring you relief. Let's go ahead and do this right now. Um, 
I, I started the class to say, what are some things that kind of are helpful for us when we're going through adversity and suffering? Obviously, the things that uh, Eliphaz is doing, pointing the finger at Job, judging Job, giving him all kinds of false theology that wasn't helpful at all. Job said, I could do the same thing. That wouldn't help anything. But what, what I would do, I would encourage you and I would comfort you. Turn over here to uh, chapter 21 for just a second. Chapter 21. Notice what it says there in verse number 2. Verse 2 of chapter 21. Listen carefully to my words. Let this be the consolation that you give me. Let's talk about the importance. A few of you guys kind of mentioned this when we talk. Well, what, what's helpful for some, somebody that's going through a hard time and going through adversity is just the importance of listening. Now, our upstairs video guys, uh, can you key up that uh, video on listening for us? It's just about a one minute uh, section of something there. See if that will boot up for us. Keep our fingers crossed, you know, whenever. You're messing with the technology, it doesn't always cooperate. Here we go. Crank up the volume just a little bit, too. I don't need anyone. I don't need anyone. The last time I trusted someone, I got hurt. <laughs> I don't want that. <laughs> I don't want, want, want that. It's just easier to be able to be alone. If you want to get anywhere in this world, you have to do it alone. Otherwise split everything, argue over everything. Why be destined? Why destine yourself for heartbreak? So I decided, so I decided to make it a point to never get close to anything or anyone again. So far I've, I've loved every minute of it. I've loved, loved every minute of it. Just me. That's it. I want to be loved. I want to be loved. To be loved. I want to be loved. To be loved. That's it. Ah, okay. A little different twist on things there. Okay. You know, as we talked about earlier, you know, you, you say one thing, but you mean another. And that was a classic example of that. But what was she saying? What were her words saying? Well, what were kind of her underlying words? What was she truly saying and, and asking for there? Let's start with what she actually was saying. If we were to take her words literally, what was she saying? Don't trust anybody. What else? Just kind of leave me alone. I've got this. I'm just going to do it by myself, and that's probably the best way. Uh-huh, yeah. I, I've tried to trust people in the past. That has not worked for me. It's really hurt me. I'm not going to go there again. Okay, that's what she's saying. Now, what was she really saying in the little cuts and the fast-forwards or rewind? What was coming across there? What did, what did she really want? She wanted to be loved. She wanted to be cared for. Now, to be able to pick that up, you know, what, what a person is really trying to say, what are they kind of needing in the time, you need to listen, don't you? You need to listen, listen well uh, in these uh, situations here. Let's go to the book of Proverbs, that great book of wisdom. Let's look at a couple uh, verses there on listening. Let's go to chapter 10, and then we'll jump over to chapter 18. Chapter 10, verse 19. All right. First of all, 1019 says this. When words are many, sin is not absent. But he, and we could put a slash she, but he or she who holds their tongue is wise. So there's sometimes it's better just not to say anything, to be quiet in a situation. Okay? And then jump over here to chapter 18, verse 13. Eighteen verse thirteen. 
He who answers before listening, that is his folly and his shame. All right? So let's take some time to talk about some basic principles about good listening skills. Good listening skills. We're going to be talking about communication for just a minute. Some of this I, I talked when we were doing a leadership class in the fellowship hall on a, on a Sunday morning. We, we really emphasized the importance of communication amongst leaders. Because communication is difficult. You have a message that you want to send to another party. So you send that message. They've got to be able to receive it, analyze it, give you some feedback to make sure I got the right message. Now, there's all kinds of things that can impact how that message is being sent, how it's received, how it's being reciprocated. But in order for the process to work at all, we have to have really good listening skills, very good listening skills. Let me give you a few in that I want you to be thinking about a few as well. All right. So again, we're trying to focus in in a scenario where people are going through adversity. They're going through difficulty. They have some kind of loss and various degrees of loss is going on. What could be helpful to be helpful comforters, not worthless uh, comforters like Job's friends were? Number one, let the person speak. Let that person speak. Don't rush them. Give them time to be able to get that out. Now, why do you think that's important? Why should we make sure that we're being very patient to allow them to talk? I kind of answered my wife's essay to a Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay, and that's when she gives you the karate chop. Yeah, well, listen up here. Wait a second. I haven't got it all out yet. <laughs> yeah, see, because isn't it easy to, all right, they're sending the message, I'm trying to receive the message, I'm already thinking of what my response is going to be, instead of, mm, button my lip for a little bit, make sure my ears are tuned in, I want to really hear what they're having to say, so I, that there's a less chance of a miscommunication, Okay. All right, why, why do we take our time to allow somebody to get the information out? Y yes, yes. What if, you know, maybe you're not that person. Some people are just real natural extroverts. It just flows out of them. What if you're more on the quieter side and it's hard to get it out? Or you're nervous about getting it out? Or like Karen said, it's so painful. I, I can't quite get it out, or maybe I'm struggling trying to think of the words that explain how I'm really feeling. So a person that is wise wants to listen. Make sure I'm taking the time to listen to what they're actually saying, okay? Allow them to get it out, principle number one. Number two, do your best, do your best not to argue or to correct them. Do your best not to argue or correct them. So, Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz did a real good job seven days sitting out there on the ash heap with Job. Didn't say a word. Again, we discovered that's part cultural, that somebody that had such great loss, you don't speak until they speak. Job finally spoke, poured out his heart. Then his friends jumped in, argued with him, piled on him, started judging him, and things that he said. Why is it important just to allow a person just to say something without having to argue with them and debate them. Again, they're going through a hard time. They're going through adversity. Why is that important? Good listening skill. Yes. Ah. Uh, yes. That's right. So Michelle talked about that they just need to vent. They just need to get it out. Every time that you interrupt them or correct them or try to restate like we were really reading that Eliphaz did, you know, Job, you're just a, a hot windbag. You know, your lips are giving you away. And so they're arguing and debating with them instead of just saying, okay, sometimes you just got to get it out. 
you got to pour it out. I had a friend of mine that he said, uh, sometimes you just got to get the poison out. You know, think of like if a snake bit you, you've got to get that poison out, all right, so that they can heal. Sometimes people just need to vent, just need to talk about it, just to get it out. And then sometimes they'll come back later and say, thank you for just listening. Uh, I'm glad you didn't jump in because, you know, I wasn't really meaning all the things that I was saying. I just needed to talk. I just needed to get it out. Okay? Number three, feel free to maybe ask some questions or to uh, follow up a little bit with them. That they're talking a little bit, and maybe you just ask for some clarity. Is, is this what I understand that you're saying? Or, you know, what do you think feeling like that? You know, what, what was going on? What were you thinking when you were doing that? Just to know that you were really paying attention and listening. What are some unhealthy listening skills that people do? You're trying to talk, you're trying to share something serious, and what are they doing that isn't very helpful at times? Neil talked about one trying to cut them off and think of what they're saying. Ken, were you saying? Or John? Finish their sentence for them. Or maybe even correct it with their grammar. You know, I've seen a few of, uh, folks do that. Just try to correct their grammar. You didn't even say that right. Okay? That's never helpful. What else? Yeah. <laughs> If you ever hear this is like a major thing you're going through, oh, that wasn't anything compared to what I went through, you know. Are you even paying attention? You know, oh, there's another time we can talk about how devastating that was to you, but this, this is how I feel. This is like a really low time for me. So just, just to listen without having to comment to try to trump me that you have a bigger, more painful story than I have. Okay, what else? Unhealthy thing to do. When trying to listen when somebody's trying to talk to you about something serious. Interrupt them there. Or what if I get distracted messing around with stuff? Play with my phone, go wandering around in other rooms and stuff like that. You know, you might want to sit down, look at one another. I remember Brother uh, A. Blinken out there in, in uh, Lubbock, Texas. Wonderful preacher, missionary, el longtime elder and stuff like that. He said, all right, all you young preachers and missionaries and stuff, he said, men, here's what you need to do every now and then. He said, keep a folding chair in the bedroom. I'm like, folding chair in the bedroom, what are you going to do that? Sometimes your wife just needs to talk to you, and you get the folding chair out and sit down and say, honey, what is it? Let's just talk about it. Even if it's 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night, you're getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning, let's just talk about this. Because she needs to vent. You don't need to interrupt. Don't be falling asleep over there, messing with your phone, doing all these distractions. Stuff. Just pay attention, ask questions, clarify. Allow her to get things off her chest. Remember not too long ago, keeping a secret, Crystal was having a frustrating day and stuff like that. This is our secret. This is our class. We'll sit in this class. You guys online, too. Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so she had a tough day or whatever. And, uh, and so came in after work, and we just started visiting. All of a sudden, just kind of talking 10, 15 minutes, and she's like, oh, I just needed to get that out. I'm like, most guys don't do that, you know? You know, if Quant came over to my house, he wouldn't come over for 20 minutes and say, wait, I just needed to dump this stuff on you here. I feel so much better. Guys don't generally do that. We might keep it real short or something, but sometimes, you know, ladies just need to do that. And so us guys just need to listen, just to be there. And pay attention. Give them affirmation there. Okay? Uh, look them in the eye. I think that's part of it. Don't be afraid of the silence. You know, if, if they don't say anything for 10, 10, or, 10 or 20 seconds, that's okay. Karen talked about it. Sometimes it takes a little while to get it out, to get it flowing, to try to, you know, maybe I'm a very upset and emotional about this, and the, my brain isn't firing like it normally would. So give them some time to get it out. Then my last one, um, listen with your head. And that's what the video clip was about there, is that I know that you're saying this, but if I'm really listening, I'm hearing the things that are being said in between. So here is going to be your class assignment. It's funny how if you ever study for a class, 
A lot of our teachers would experience this. It seems like the Lord provides an opportunity for you to put it to work, you know. And so I was trying to really be attentive to say, hey, as I talk about listening and stuff, maybe there would be an opportunity this week or something that that, that may come up. And sure enough, a situation came and, oh, don't you just want to say something sometimes? But you know it's probably better just to listen. And I might be doing more good than jumping in and saying stuff that really may upset the person or amplify the, the situation. So really pay attention this week um, and, and make sure to listen if you, if you run across somebody that's kind of hurting or struggling or going through an issue there, okay? All right, so that's your, that's your class assignment for the upcoming week here. See if the Lord providentially puts something together for you. All right, how much time do we have? How in the world does our time go so fast over here? Oh, man, oh, man. Just goes too fast. Let's go back here, uh, get as much as we can. Go back here to the book of Job. I'm just going to read the rest of the chapter. We'll only have two or three minutes. Just so that we kind of have an understanding of how Job was feeling, what he was going through. He was hoping that his friends would be comforters. They weren't doing a very good job. He tells them, here's what I would do. Now jump in there with verse 7. He feels that God's really against him. Surely, O oh God, you've worn me out. Uh, you have devastated my entire household. You have bound me, and it's become a witness. My godness rises up and testifies against me. God assails me and tears me in his anger, gnashes his teeth at me. And opponents fasten on me his piercing eyes. Men open their mouths to jeer at me. They, they strike me on the cheek in scorn and scorn and unite together against me. God's turned me over to the evil men and thrown me into the clutches of the wicked. All was well with me, but he shattered me. He seized me by the neck, crushed me. He has made me his target. His archers surround me. Without pity, he pierces my kidneys, spills my gall on the ground, and and again, he bursts upon me. He rushes me like a warrior. I, I sewed sackcloth over my skin, buried my brow in the dust. My face is red with weeping. Deep shadows ring my eyes. Yet my hands have been free of violence. My prayer is pure. O oh, earth, do not cover my blood. May my cry never be laid to rest. Even now, my witness is in heaven. My advocate's on high. My intercessor is my friend. As my eyes pour out tears to God on behalf of a man, he pleads with God. As a man pleads for his friend, only a few years will pass before I go on the journey of no return. So as we're kind of listening to Job's words, he really feels like God is against him for some reason. God has allowed this thing to happen. That's how he's feeling. Now Job will never sin against God by losing his faith in God. God's going to correct him for the accusations that were coming to him. And so we're going to see that in a few weeks. Um, but he always believed that he had a witness in heaven, somebody that would argue his case. He feels like God's kind of against him, but maybe somebody could I, kind of intercede to God to show his situation. He said, my prayer's been pure. My hands have been free of violence. Don't believe I've done anything wrong, but I realize I only have a little time left. He was so sick. I mean, his circles around his eyes, he's skin and bones, as Steve was pointing out. He's covered with all these sores from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He said, the only thing I get to look forward to is the grave. That's how he's feeling. And so we want to listen to how Job is suffering, and we'd want to be people that would offer encouragement and the compassion when somebody's suffering. Okay, so let's bow for a word of prayer. We'll wrap it up for tonight. Father, we thank you so much. Uh, wow. Looking at this incredible example of your servant Job, the things that he went through, and how uh, miserable Satan can make somebody's life. Father, help us to be people that are encouragers, that are comforters, that can say a, a good word to, to help boost somebody up, to give a hug when needed, to just be available and listen uh, when people are going through a hard time. Help us to learn this, these important lessons uh, from the book of Job, and help us not to be people that make situations worse, but, but try to take a a difficult uh, situation that somebody's going through, a trial, suffering, loss. Uh, Father, to stand with them, to pray with them, to, to love them. Uh, Father, so uh, we thank you so much for the opportunity to study. 
to be together here tonight. It's encouraging to, to see each other and to spur one another on. Uh, Father, help us to be with you because we know that you're going to be faithful to us. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here tonight and have a wonderful evening and safe travels back home.